As Sister Bailey said, Brother Jonathan's text is 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16. And this verse speaks of all Scripture being given by inspiration of God. Now this is the foundation of this text, that, that the Scriptures were given through inspiration. And so I want to look at what this means, uh, that the Scriptures were inspired. And in studying this, I see a, a picture of like God breathing out His Word and the, the holy men breathing it in so that they were able to like exhale this truth on paper and being able to, to write out the, the, the will of God and his thoughts and his mind. And in this way, we were given the ability to know the mind of God Amen. through reading the, the holy scriptures that, that God gave us. Now this is this the fact that the scriptures were inspired is actually what gives the scriptures the power to be able to accomplish the things that this that uh, Second Timothy three sixteen speaks of that it gives the scriptures the ability to be profitable in for doctrine for reproof for correction and for instruction in righteousness so these the scriptures being inspired. <laughs> is the power. It gives it the power to be profitable. And in Hebrews 4.12, which Brother Aaron spoke to us of already today, this, this speaks of the scriptures as being quick and powerful, which we, as we know, the word quick here means living. And so this, these are not mere words on a page. There's a, there's, these are alive. They're able to have an effect on the soul of men in a way that dead words cannot. <clears throat> when something is living, it has the ability to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. The same text in Hebrews, it speaks of uh, the scriptures as having the power to divide, having the power <coughs> to make a separation. It also has the power to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. So this is not something that something that that the dead can do. The dead don't discern. So this this is an evidence that the scriptures are alive. <clears throat> so we know that this this task could not be accomplished by something that was inanimate or dead, and that, that even a sword without someone to wield it mm -hmm. is is harmless yeah. it has to have the power behind it in order in order for it to do the work that it was designed to do and so the inspiration that god the, the fact that these scriptures were inspired is is what gives it the power as the as the soldier gives power to the sword now divine the, the as i said before that the divine inspiration is the foundation of this text in 2 Timothy. So I want to speak for a moment on how did God inspire these the holy scriptures. We've in in other places in the scriptures we learn that God doesn't do everything the same way each time that he works. It's, he uses different means in order to accomplish a different work. And the scriptures are this is the means through which God used to inspire the scriptures is he chose different men in order to bring the scriptures to, to, to come. And these writers, he chose them very particularly. He didn't just choose anyone at random. He chose holy men, men who were, who were ready to receive this work, men who had, were living in a manner that they could do this work. God wasn't going to use like an unclean vessel in order to bring something this important. And so I want to show a few examples of the different ways that God inspired these the, the scriptures. The first example I want to show is Moses. God was able to give Moses special revelation into things that had already come to pass. Things that, that Moses could not have had personal knowledge of because he wasn't there to witness it. Things such as the creation, 
the fall of man, the flood. I mean, Moses was able to write these things down in detail. Details that you would have to be there in order to see. So this is another evidence that the scriptures were inspired by God because he's the only one who could give these details. He was there. He did this. And so uh, that's one example of uh, how God used Moses. Another is uh, Daniel. Daniel was given this special revelation through visions and dreams. Um, he was able to receive this revelation in that manner. And then there are others who were led to record like the thoughts of their hearts or the secret things yeah. that were within them, like King David. Mm -hmm. He was given, uh, he was led to, to be able to write down these things that, yeah. that you, we wouldn't have known about him had he not written it down. And even God said of King David that he was a man after God's own heart. So in writing these things down and in, in showing the secret things of his heart, we're actually able to see something of God, too. We're able to see if David was a man after God's own heart, and this is how David's heart was, then this, this is, we see a lot of likenesses in God himself. And so God used David in order to reveal more of himself. And then there were the prophets. They were given special revelation to see things that were to come, the things of the future. And, and many of them didn't understand at the time. They weren't given themselves to have understanding of the things that they spoke of. They were, as we know, they were given for, for those who were to come so that we, our understanding would be perfected. And then there were the apostles who were given the ability to have like a holy recollection of the things that they had witnessed while, while Christ was on the earth. And, be, and being able to record these things with great detail, remembering exact words that Jesus used. Uh, and, and they were also given to be able to, to see things that they weren't present for, such as Jesus' birth. None of the disciples were present to witness that. Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. He was alone in the wilderness. But these, these apostles were able to write down Th these things. Also events concerning Christ's resurrection. There was no man to, there to witness this, but these men were given the revelation to be able to write these things down. So all of these things that God revealed to these holy men were given for our learning so that we could know the, 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 the secret things that many had lived before, before these words had been written down, and they desired to know these things. But because of God inspiring these holy men to write down the things that they had seen, now we are able to understand and to know these things. <clears throat> the apostles were also given special revelation to see and open up spiritual things. This is like a new... Uh, uh, yeah. This is different than the revelation that was given in the days of old. These are, these are spiritual things, the, the uh, substance, so to speak, that the, that the Old Testament gave the shadow of. Mm -hmm. And so this, this was uh, a very important part of, of the scriptures in the New Testament because it gave us the ability to see the unseen things. And finally, the Apostle John was given the revelation of heavenly things, being able to see things going on in heavenly realms, <clears throat> and also things concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so we see a, a vast difference in the means through which God used to inspire his words, but all of these things work together to make one holy scripture. Yeah. So in all of these examples, God chose a particular person in order to speak through. And he did this because there, 
it would have been one thing for him to have just caused one person to write everything down, and it was very separate from the person who wrote it down. But in this way, God was using his people to, to preserve his name in the earth. But each, as you read through the books of Moses, you learn something of Moses in addition to learning about God. Amen. And in reading the book of Daniel, you learn about Daniel and how, how he was faithful. And, and so on and so forth throughout the whole scriptures, we're able to see how God works through men mm -hmm. to be able to, uh, to use them and to, be, and, and to cause them to be faithful servants. So we're learning more than if we had just had a detailed step-by-step -step, uh, pamphlet or, or book that can teach us how to be good people. And so there's, the scriptures are, there's more to the scriptures than, and we've already spoken of this, there's more to the scriptures than just teaching us how to be a good person or teaching us this or that. We're actually learning God, who God is, and we're learning who his people are in him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And I said before that God did not choose the ungodly or the wicked to be the vessels through which he inspired his word. And so knowing this, see how important it is that we as his servants constantly live in a manner where we can be used at any time to do Amen. the work that God would have us to do. Yeah. These holy men were given a work to do, but they were ready to do it. They didn't, they didn't live in a manner that was inconsistent <laughs> with the work that God would have them to do. <clears throat> so we, we then, as his servants, want to always be living in a manner so that God can use us in whatever capacity he sees as right. Amen. We do not want to be found unfitting or unworthy to be used in the service of, this, of, of our king. And so, Brother Jonathan is going to come and further expound this text, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16, and I'll read it again. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And I'll read 17 also. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. Amen. It was very good, wasn't it? Amen. Maybe I should have given the introduction. <laughs> well, as you can see, our main passage deals with writings that we understand to be revelation from the Lord. And as God's people, it's important to have a proper view of the Scriptures and see them the way God describes them. It's good to understand what the Scriptures are for and what they can do for those who read and hear them. Now, we'll make one note here because... Apparently, some make note of this. It's like, what scriptures exactly are at reference here? Well, look back one verse in verse 15, where Paul says to Timothy, he says, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise in the salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. <coughs> so that should make it evident that what he's talking about here is what we commonly know as the Old Testament. Yeah, right. yeah. You know, when he says, from a child, you've known the holy scriptures, he's not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the writings of the prophets and of Moses. Many things that were written in the New Testament, they weren't yet recorded when Paul wrote this. Yeah. However, even though the Old Testament may be what's in reference here, what is said is most certainly true concerning what we know as the New Testament. It's been given by God. It's been inspired. It's profitable. It can be used for doctrine. It can be used for reproof. Amen. So with this in mind... I will speak on this passage with the whole of Scripture in mind. Seeing to me, it does say all Scripture. <laughs> Just take it as it stands. Now, the general idea here is that all holy writings have God as its source. And there's nothing in the Scriptures that God did not intend to put there or was written independent of His influence. Now, the word inspire is just made to draw in English. The literal meaning is to breathe. And it's used in this sense... To inhale air into the lungs or drawing in breath. Drawing something in. Inspire. As opposed to expire, which in its little means is to breathe out or throw air out of the lungs. In the Greek, you get a little different definition, but you'll find that the Greek and the English definition go hand in hand. Because this phrase, given by inspiration of God, that's translated from one word. Which is a combination of the Greek words for deity or God and the word for Breathe or breeze or blow hard. 
So the literal meaning is God breathed. Amen. Straight from the mouth of God in the Greek is what that means. Which actually is how several versions translate this part of the passage. The NIV, the, ES, or the New International, the English Standard, and the Complete Jerusalem, they actually just wrote it that way. All scripture is God breathed. That's a good, that's a good rendering. So with these things in mind, scripture being given by inspiration of God really does mean... God gave men revelation and he moved them to write the things that we read in the scripture. I mean, it's, isn't it interesting in the English, the meaning is breathe in. In the Greek, it's God breathing out. It came from God into man so that men can communicate it. A picture of this is found in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 where it says, The Lord put forth his hand, he touched Jeremiah's mouth. He said, I have put my words in your mouth. Amen. That's a good example of inspiration. Came from God into the mouth of man. So when he's speaking, he's speaking what God is saying. Yeah. Yeah. Now Webster's 1828 dictionary gave this meaning to the word inspiration. I will note, you will not find this definition in dictionaries today. In this definition, the word infusion is used. That means to pour. <laughs> this definition for inspiration says, the infusion of ideas into the mind by the Holy Spirit, the conveying into the minds of men ideas, notices, or munitions by extraordinary, extraordinary or supernatural influence, or the communication of the divine will to the understanding by suggestions or impressions on the mind which leave no room to doubt the reality of their supernatural origin. <laughs> you won't find that in dictionaries today. But I say, Amen, Brother Webster, to that. Amen. Thanks for listing that. This definition shows that any thought recorded in the scripture came from the result of God giving knowledge and understanding to the writer. Mm -hmm. Men did not naturally just come up with these things by their own efforts or by their own intellects. In intellects. Rather, the scriptures are the result of divine assistance. Mm -hmm. Inspiration also does involve influence of some kind. Like inspiration can be used in that sense too. Like it, usually when people say you've you've inspired me, it's like you've done something that moved me to do this thing. That's how people use the word inspire. And there are men whom God spoke to directly, like Moses. He spoke to God face to face. And then there are other men who God spoke to in dreams, like Daniel. Whatever the means that God used to inspire men to write, the conclusion is always the same. It came from God. And it cannot be credited to another. There is another passage that speaks on the same subject, and it's beneficial to join it to our main passage. And very rarely do not hear this passage quote alongside with our main one. That is 2 Peter 1, 20 and through 21, which reads, No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. The meaning is quite clear. The message found in the scriptures is not the result of man's imagination. Those who wrote these things were not speaking for themselves, but were writing only what the Lord gave them. The means by which men wrote was by being moved by the Holy Ghost. The writers of the scriptures were not the author of its content, but were only instruments used to communicate what the Lord said. They could not, they did not, were not left like to their own devices, in other words. Rather, they would write under the Holy Spirit's guidance. Like, wherever direction they went, the Holy Spirit was like there, like showing them where to go, like what to write down, like what point to make, where, what conclusion to come to. He was there assisting them the entire time. The point is that men who wrote down these things, they're enlightened. That's the point. It isn't just, it, it's not like speculation. They're not writing their own personal conclusions or opinions. And sadly, men ad today, they adopt all kinds of absurd teachings and doctrines based on opinions and conclusions, rather than what's on true and right. This is one of the damages sectarianism has done. It's yeah. building doctrine on conclusions. It's not building like what the Lord has declared. It's like what man has said about what the Lord has declared. This is not right. Even you, you look in the secular world, they've done this too. They're not, they're not clear of this charge. This theory of evolution, a man comes and says, well, I looked at some finches, they, ha they have different beaks, but hey, they must have been one set they all came from. So he made this doctrine that everything came from one source, common ancestry. And so men have these teachings on this man's conclusion. Yeah. Amen. But this is not what the men's scripture did. They didn't give you a conclusion. They gave you direct revelation from the Lord. Amen. See, that's what, that's what we get to. The scripture being inspired is what gives it its power. That's why we base things on it. That's why we use it. That's what makes it useful. That's what makes it beneficial to those who hear it. 
These are not just the words of anybody, but the revelation of God. Therefore, it has power to work in a person and communicate the purpose and nature of God. The fact is that God wants men to know him and understand his ways, and he's provided a means for men to know him. That's the importance of reading the scriptures. This is a, as God has revealed his nature in writing. He has shown what he is doing in writing, what, what he's going to do in the future, what he's doing with his people. All of that is shown in this writing, this scripture. And that is why the writings are justly referred to as the holy scriptures. It like distinguishes it from all of the writings. Amen. It's holy scriptures. Amen. They are divine words that are given to us by God. And I also, too, want to make a note on the means by which God communicated these things to us. He did use men to get, he used men. Uh -huh. Used men to write and give these things to us. And as 2 Peter one twenty one says, holy men of God yeah. wrote these things as the Holy Ghost moved them. We don't have books written by Cain. That's right. Or how about Esau? Do you have a book from him? Yeah. Pharaoh? Maybe. Ahab? How about the book of Jezebel? Do you see that in the Bible? Maybe. The gospel according to Judas? Yeah. Ananias and the epistle written by Ananias and Sapphira? You don't, or Simon the sorcerer, epistle from him. No, you do not have these writings from these men. These are wicked men, known for doing evil and offended God. God will not use men like this to communicate the truth, because they are liars. The closest thing, well, the scripture, they're the revelation of God in writings that testify of Jesus Christ. They cannot be made known by someone living contrary to the law of God. They can't. So God rose up holy men, that did what was right in their sight. They're like fit men for the job. Amen. He rose up men that were able to take on this work. Amen. Devout men able to receive revelation. They weren't blinded by darkness. They had, they had enlightenment. They were able to see and understand and communicate these things accurately. I realize men like to make an issue out of this. You know, like who wrote the Bible? Was it God or men? Men wrote the Bible. Like, is that anything profound? It says right here, holy men wrote the Bible. Yeah, we agree with that. Men did write it down, but did men author it? No, they did not. That is not, that's not, that's not so. These men were far from being the fallible men that people accuse them to be. It's a wrong view to have the scriptures, to view like, well, it was just, it was just written by men. That's it. Not have any trace of God whatsoever. That's a wrong view. And it's an unjustifiable view as well. That's like one of those foolish and unlearned things that you just avoid put it away. Amen. The writers of the scriptures, they're not like it. They were not like everybody else. These, if you read like who they were, these were unique people. Unique people that did not live like those around them. Holy, unique men able to write the things of God. Now, why do I mention all of this? Because the way you view the scriptures will have an impact on how you handle them. Amen. It will affect how you read them and how seriously you will take what is said. Today, I believe people are so casual about scriptures because they don't believe what our main passage says. They don't believe it came from God. That's why they take liberty to just neglect and do damage to it. I believe that men in general consider this to be just another book. Maybe some nice stories, some nice examples about how to live a good life or do nice things for people. But men who view the scriptures that way, they're going to have to give an account for this. So it was, it's good to have a right view here Amen. of God's word. This is inspired writing. It came from God. You can't view it casually. Which brings us to our next point, which is seeing that God inspires the scriptures, how wise is it for men to dabble with them? Today, many professed believers have taken upon themselves become critics of the scripture, frequently changing what is said or assigning new meanings to the words that have been used. Frequent, and we live in a day where like tire criticism, this is like really common. Reading this, it's very common in the church, and men read the scriptures, they were the real critical eye, as if it were riddled with errors and mistakes. That's why you would have to read it that way anyway. How often do you hear people say, what does the original say? See, that's, a, that's an unbelief question. You don't believe what it says. You're expressing your unbelief. I say the same thing. It says say the same thing that it says in English. That's what it says. And I don't even know what the original said. <laughs> men don't believe that God has preserved his word. That's really what it comes down to. The church, having become so divided in its views and practices, has opened the door for all kinds of assaults on the scriptures. This is one of the first ways the devil attacked. Man, he changed what God said. And so, what happened when he did that? The fall of man happened after that. Well, since men are divided, the devil has continued to use his old tactic that he used from the beginning. Change it. Twist it around a little bit. And he didn't even change it much. He added one word. I shall not surely die. One word couldn't hurt. Well, well, in that case, it made a huge impact. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Men twist the key meaning of key passages in order to make them fit with their own personal views and creeds. 
Men retranslate the scriptures over and over again, change how passages are worded so that they contradict each other. Even Bibles today in stores are so packed so full of footnotes and commentaries and explanations, some of which are contradictory to the message, that they can't hardly be called Bibles anymore. Yeah. I mean, this reminds me of last time I updated my phone. I mean, a phone today, it's not even a phone. They, they watch movies on them. They take pictures with them. They download things on them. And when I go, I have to tell them, I was like, I just want a phone. <laughs> not a handheld television set. <laughs> not a miniature computer, not a pocket-sized gaming console. Yeah. A phone. And you know what? I'm doing this when I go get Bibles now. I just want a Bible. Yeah. Leave all those new features out and just give me the Word. Yeah. Leave that stuff out. <laughs> Ultimately, men dabble with the Word because they don't believe God inspired it. The fact is they take liberty to change, the fact they take liberty to change the Scripture, that, that just, that's proof of that claim right there. Yeah. Because if they knew what they were messing with, <laughs> They would probably just back off and just take it the way that it says it. However, as noble as they may think they are, they're only making things worse for themselves. The scriptures, they do speak of people who do this. In Peter's second epistle, chapter 3, verse 16, he speaks of the writings of Paul containing some things that are hard to be understood, being rested by the unlearned and unstable. Rest meaning to twist, torture, pervert, and extort by violence. Unlearned refers to men who do not have knowledge, but they undertake to become expounders of the Word of God. Men who don't, they don't have understanding, but they try to explain it anyway. And then they open door, they, they create heresies this way. Unstable means these men have no settled principles or views and are inconsistent in the way that they think. Like they'll embrace this doctrine this day and they'll embrace this one the next day. Ta men tossed about by every wind and doctrine, double minded, unstable in all of their ways. These are the kind of men that handle, that have taken it upon themselves to handle the Word of God. But, such men will only bring destruction upon themselves because they are tampering with inspired writings. Yeah. That's what makes it dangerous. If it was just a book by men, who cares what it does? Who cares what changes you make? It's all the same anyway, right? Well, when you mess with God's word, you're in very, very dangerous territory. These are the inspired writings that God has given so that we might know him. We might know his Christ. That's what is in the scriptures. You change the words, you change the message, and you lead others astray. So, woe to the men who do this. And if you were ever tempted to change, add, or take away from God what God has given you, I say, beware. <laughs> Watch out. Now, having said that, seeing that the scriptures are inspired, that gives us plenty of reason to believe them. That's like just a solid ground right there. Paul says, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. Therefore, it's right to believe what is written. As pointed out earlier, the scriptures being inspired, that's like the foundation that holds up the rest of what is said. He, said, he didn't just say, all scripture is profitable for the use of doctrine. No, no, he said he's a foundation first. All doctrine, or all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and he builds on that. It's prof therefore, it's profitable. Therefore, it can be used for doctrine. Therefore, you know, that's like the thing that holds up the rest of the passage. Right there, if it, it wasn't inspired, it wouldn't be of any use in any of these areas. The fact that it didn't come by the will of man and came from God to remove any question as to whether or not it should be accepted. Now, it, this may surprise some, but the scripture is frequently referenced in the scripture. Particularly in the New Testament, Jesus quoted scripture several times and even did so when tempted by the devil. He went to the scripture. What does the scripture say? You have read in the scripture. He said to the devil himself, as it's written in the scripture. That was his, that was his rebuke to him. Paul also made mention of several Old Testament writings. Philip he told Nathaniel that Jesus was the Christ that Moses and the prophets wrote about. He knew what the scripture said. He had some familiarity with these things. Disciples were told that, or Christ told the disciples that the temple would be torn down and it would be rebuilt in three days. He spoke of the temple of his body, but they didn't know that. But it says that when Jesus did rise from the dead, they remembered what Jesus said and they believed the scripture. Yeah. Amen. Now, what, what do you mean, believe the scripture? He, what it means is he, he was fulfilling what the scriptures were talking about. They remembered what the scriptures said, and like, this is who he was talking about. That's what like, built their faith in the, the things. But knowing the scripture, if they didn't know the scripture, then you know, this probably would not have happened. The Bereans, they searched the scriptures daily to see if the things that they heard were true. They knew the scriptures. They got in, and they looked right into these things. Mm -hmm. Timothy had said he knew the scriptures from a young age. Even the Pharisees were well learned in the scriptures, even though they didn't understand what they were talking about. Now, the point is that men knew the scriptures and read them because they knew it was from God. 
This is really what it comes down to. They, it was a completely different atmosphere. They knew God inspired these things. And so they took that initiative to learn what he said and live by what he said. The scriptures were recognized as the final authority, and hence men were quick to learn and retain the things written in it. This shows the importance of reading scriptures with faith, believing what you read. When you read the scriptures without or having faith in God, you will see that God will open these things up to you, <laughs> and, you'll, and they won't be hid from you any longer. Don't allow yourself to be like this untoward generation who neglects the word of God and has no interest in it. Take advantage of what God has given us, just like it was said to Timothy. Excuse me. You've known the Holy Scriptures. They're able to make you wise, but finish the rest of the passage. Through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You see, when you read the Scriptures, you got to see, you got to understand, this is the, these are, as Jesus said, these are they which testify of me. If you have to see, you have to see Christ, you have to believe that Jesus is the one that's being talked about in the Scriptures here. That's when these things will open up. Through faith in Christ Jesus, they make you wise. Don't stop at make you wise to salvation. Read the rest. It's through faith that they make you wise. Now he says some. All scripture, it's profitable. Having been inspired, it's profitable. Something being profitable means that it yields or brings gain or profit. And since God inspires the scriptures, they are advantageous and useful in the following areas. Those being doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Now this is a good reminder that the scriptures are effective, and hence we are exhorted to make use of them and apply them to certain areas. Whenever we speak the truth, we're speaking what is declared in God's word. Something we've seen here. Like when Paul's reason with those around, it says he showed with the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. That was his, that was his basis. That was his use. He was, see, he was an example of this. He, knew, he saw his profitable and he made use of it. And in that sense, he was mighty in the scriptures. Paul came to Thessalonica and it said he stayed with the Jews and reasoned with them out of the scriptures. And it says this was his manner. Mm-hmm. So these are examples of what the text is talking about. Men, they read it, they... They take in the knowledge, but they make use of it. They apply it in some way. And I'll go over these few things just briefly, just to get a general understanding. It's like doctrine, that's teaching. And all teaching about the will of God and his purpose has to be based on what he has revealed. Jesus said that the scriptures testified of him, so I imagine that this would make them a solid basis for any doctrines we may build on his character, person, and nature. And God has called this the record he's given of his own son. And this should make it clear that any teachers concerning salvation are to be based on what is written. Scripture is profitable for doctrine, meaning that any teaching that's based on the Scripture is sure to be sound doctrine and yielding good fruit. Minds will be more sober and more alert and more able to understand when you use the Scriptures to teach Mm -hmm. about the Lord. Then he says reproof. Reproof is to criticize or correct, to disapprove strongly or censor, or dealing directly with error or wrongdoing. In the Greek, the word means to prove, to test, or conviction. This refers to convincing men of the truth and confounding those who deny it. It is convincing men of their sins and exposing error and inconsistency. I mean, if we are to criticize, disapprove, or convince someone, then we have to do so with the Scriptures in mind, and that is our basis. What is written in the Scriptures will be the basis for any opposition that is voiced out, and it will be the basis for why men become convinced, meaning like moved by argument won over by argument. Like Apollos did, he showed with the scripture, and that's what won them over of the truth. Then he says correction. And correction has to do to restoration to natural use. Correction, you know, if you look at reproof and correction, you might think they're the same. But correction has to do with pointing them back in the right direction, getting them back to doing what is right, restoring them to, like, if they fall, raising them back up. If any are in error of the scriptures, they're used to get people back on the right path, and your fallen scripture can be used to make a person stand again. If any darkness, the scripture can be used to help guide a person back into the light. Get a person back in right standing. It's not just correcting a problem, but helping a person to continue in the right direction. And then instruction in righteousness. This is instruction regarding the principles of justice and what is right. Men do not just need to flee wickedness. They need to know how to live holy before God. And the scriptures are used in this regard as well. The scriptures can be used to instruct a man how to live in such a way that he can please God in everything that he does. The point being that from these various things, the scriptures are not just supposed to be just read and then just put on the shelf. People are content with reading. They'll, if anyone can just read a book, they'll read it like, all right, got my Bible do- reading done for the day. But they're supposed to be used as well. We have seen from this verse alone that they can be used to acquaint men with the truth 
convince them of their errors, reform them, and teach them what is right. Scripture can be used in all of those areas. If you are faithful to use Scripture these ways, then you will see that they are truly most useful indeed. And as you look at the last verse here, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly first in all good works, some say perfect, they say complete. It's like he, equ he fully equips him, fully equips him to properly live before the Lord. So obviously, like the, this is like, that's like the result of doing this. Using Scripture in these ways, that's what the, the verse 17 there, that's, so that's your result. That's what's going to be produced. So, I mean, that, if, if it does cause men to be furnished unto all good works, that should give the motivation to use it in these various ways. Yes, amen. Now, in conclusion, may we all remember to maintain a proper view of the Scriptures so that we might make the best use of them and rightly divide those things that we read and consider. These things came from God, and nothing that comes from God is unworthy of our time or consideration. Read the revelation of God is given and know your God.